Okay, thank you. And uh, so um, I'm going to say right away what this talk is about, but I will give more background information after this. Okay, so this is I'm going to be talking about the model of the macaque uh, V1 cortex. Macaque is a monkey whose uh, visual system is very much like ours. So people use that a lot to study the visual system. And the visual cortex is the part of our brain that processes sensory informa vis visual information. It's located at the back. So if you look at that picture there, the eyes are uh, in front. And on the, at the back of the head is the vi where the visual cortex is. And I'm going to be talking about the input layers to the visual system. And uh, so th this is what I'm going to try to do. I will try to show you a model where that has incorporated uh, most of the basic properties. Not one property, m many models are kind of phenomenological models to demonstrate one property. We've tried to make it uh, demonstrate, uh, we've, we've tried to reproduce most of the properties that are uh, in, in, in the V1 cortex. And there'll be some a uh, bit of analysis of dynamical mechanisms, okay. So maybe I should first say what the goals of the talk are. The first, the goal, the first goal is to um, a, a more quantitative understanding of biology. In this case, how, uh, how, the visual corte how the cortex works. The second goal is to understand how cortex computes. You know, the visual information comes to your retina in terms of in kind of point to point representation of the data. But in the brain, it's not represented pixel by pixel. The brain processes it, it suppresses some information, it enhances some, it does all sorts of things to it, it computes. And this computation is made possible when neurons talk to each other. So I'd like to kind of build a model that mimics that. Okay. And of course, the, uh, is, is, is not really, the goal is not really just to mimic the brain. The goal is to try to explain what's going on, uh, if we can. And so these are the goals of the mo modeling work. And if you wonder why, why, this why the visual cortex and why this particular part of the visual cortex, it's because there's a lot of data. This part is very easy to get data for. So there's already a tons of data in the uh, people have collected, uh, which is not the same as knowing what to do with them. So I'd like to try to do something with the data that's been collected. Okay. So these, uh, this, uh, the outline of the talk is that um, uh, I anticipating a mixed audience, I've prepared a slide to uh, give uh, some background information. My apologies to experts in the, in the audience who probably know much more about it than I do. Uh, then I will show you something about the model layout. Uh, not to bore you with details, but just um, the overall layout so you get a sense of what it looks like. And then I'd like to uh, give some illustration of what the model can do, and then some uh, how it's used to explain different things, mostly in terms of dynamical mechanisms. I mean, the neurons communicate each with each other via spiking. And this is, a, I, the way I, I have modeled this is as a really big dynamical system made up of lots of small constituents, namely neurons. And these neurons would talk to each other in a large network. Okay. So it has the flavor of uh, both a dynamical system and statistical mechanics. Okay, so, okay. so <coughs> this is the, my uh, very, very brief intro to the visual cortex. Okay. So right underneath your skull, it's a sheet. This is this sheet that's all kind of crinkled up that you've seen in pictures. Okay, that's two or three millimeters um, thick, and this sheet is involved in most of the. W you can think of it as your conscious thinking and behavior. Okay, so the sensory information comes through there. Your vision, aud auditory, touch, smell, all these things come through there. Uh, plus your thinking, your attention, memory, your scheming. Movements, behavior, all those things. Now, there's lots of other parts of the brain that's inside, wrapped inside the sheet that I won't uh, I'll be talking about at all. That has to, those are the parts that like control your uh, balance, your breathing, your heartbeat. Okay, so this is kind of more like the thinking part of the brain. Okay, this, the the cortex. Okay, now uh, I'm not gonna do uh, uh, talk about the whole cortex, obviously. The visual cortex is just a part of the cortex that's located, now, the, now this is a slice like this. The eyes are up and the visual cortex is back there. Okay. Um, why is it that the eyes are in front and the visual cortex is that the back seems kind of inefficient, I don't know. But that's how it is. 
but it's actually very efficient because it goes there in two steps. So from the, uh, from the oh, I can use this thing, right? So from the, so the, your eyeball is not the brain, but your retina is part of the brain. Okay? So from the retina, from the back of the retina, in one synapse, you get to this thing, which is called the lateral geniculate nucleus, okay? it's because it's bent like the shape of a knee. It's kind of like a little peanut-sized objects, two of them, one on each side. As far as we're concerned, it's like a relay station, but it's a lot more than that because it collects a lot of things, passes them to lots of places. So from your retina, one synapse and you're here, and two synapses and you're back in the, in the visual cortex. Okay. Now the visual cortex is divided into lots of different regions, V1, V2, okay? And <coughs> I'm gonna be focusing on V1, which is called the primary visual cortex. It's the first place where the information arrives and it goes into V1, okay? Now you can think of, very roughly speaking, that there are two streams. One is go, one goes for geometric, one, one, one is responsible for kind of geometric representation of objects and the other one for motion. That's really oversimplifying it. They talk to each other and things get passed back and forth. But these regions are unequal. V1 is far and away the biggest and the most important of them all. Everything is initiated there. But, but V1 has very tiny receptive fields. So what V1 neurons really only see a very tiny piece of the visual space. And some of the information is pieced together later. Okay. But everything is, starts here. And this one is much more complex than most of, uh, most of all the others. And of course, V4 and V5, these talk to, talk to the rest of cortex. So, so this is this little piece sitting here. They talk back and forth to different parts of cortex and in information get passed back and forth quite a bit. Okay. So I'm gonna be uh, talking about uh, V1, okay, and V1 only, okay. So what are some of the few things so this, this, uh, about V1 that one should know? The first thing is that there's a retinotopic map. Now in your retina, there's a map of your, the 2D visual space, okay, it's 2D. So you, 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 there's like, a, for, for mathematicians, it's like a homeomorphism of your visual space into a copy of the retina. And this is actually a copy of that in your, v, in your, in your cortex, in, in your visual cortex. So your cortex sees points that are close by in, in your visual space. The same, it's, it's really a copy, it's like a map of your visual space, okay? Now the representation is uneven. A lot more cells are devoted to looking in front and a, a lot fewer to the periphery, okay? So most of the time when you want to do ha get good, good, good data, you deal with things that are roughly in front, okay? A lot more, uh, uh, I mean a very large percentage of your, your cells are focused on this little region and it sparses out very, very quickly, okay? But it's a map that you actually see in cortex in, in this sheet, okay? So here's another thing that uh, one should know is that in V1 at least, and actually a little bit beyond, okay, there are two distinct pathways, two more or less distinct pathways. One is called magnocellular, the other one parvocellular. Okay. I'm going to be talking about the magnocellular one. The magno one, it requires very little light. So when the light is dark, you tend to, you tend to use that. It's very sharp, it saturates very, very quickly. You don't see color. At nighttime when you walk outside, you don't see color. You're using this guy, okay? When it gets brighter, the parvo cellular uh, kicks in. You see color, you see details, and so on. So these are two separate ba pathways. This one is older, and this, this, this one is newer. I'm gonna be doing the magno one because it's simpler, okay? I, I wanna go for the simpler time. <coughs> okay, the last piece of information in terms of overall background that one should know is that this, within this two, three, two to four millimeter thick sheet, there are actually lots of layers. People say six, but each one is divided into A, B, C, so I don't, I don't really know what the counts get. Don't worry about that. Just, this is just to impress you that they talk back and forth, okay? Okay, there's a lot of talking back and forth to, to one another. Now the, the layer that I'm gonna talk about is so, so everything that I'm, uh, the, the context for everything that I'm gonna say is here. I'm gonna be talking about a part of the cerebral cortex called the visual cortex. I'm gonna talk about the, the entry, the V1, the, the first place where information enters the visual cortex. 
I'm doing the metal cellular pathway, and I'm going to look at the input layer to the V1, because that is the most straightforward one, the easiest one to, 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 to try to model. Right. <coughs> uh, any, anyone wants me to elaborate any more on the stuff? So within the layer, so these different layers, you can see the cells very well under the microscope. They actually are made up of somewhat different cells, and uh, the, you, you can see the cell types are different. And it's a little bit different from layer to layer. These connections are <laughs> indicated by these arrows. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The, the, um, within each layer, they, so these, they're quite specific. They're too, so some of the layers are magno, some are parvo. So if you look at this picture, it's complicated. I'm going to focus on something called a 4C alpha, which is a single layer. And I'm going to show you the connectivity in there. Okay. Okay. So, but this, this is the kind of overall one. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to get to the model. So the model is going to be about LGN going to the V1, which is the input layer. Okay. So LGN is this little relay station when the, from the retina. It goes through there and goes to the back. 4C, 4C alpha, too lazy to type alpha, so type A, uh, is the input layer to V1. Okay. Now, this one is relatively simple because mostly, if you look at that picture down there from the last page, the main thing that feeds back to it is layer 6. Okay. Layer 6 collects a lot of information from different parts of V1 and then feeds it back. People used to think that it's unimportant, but more and more they realize it actually has very strong modulatory effects on what, what goes on. So my model will only have three components, LGN, the input layer to V1, and layer 6. Okay? And, and this is part of the magnetic pathway. So, here, here, so I want to show you a little bit about the network architecture of 4C alpha. You don't have to know any of these numbers at all. I just want to give you a sense of the type of neuroanatomy that we have tried to incorporate into the, in, into the system. So the cell densities in the, for this layer, is so, so this layer, I forgot to say, is divided into hypercolumns. Hypercolumns, uh, each hypercolumns, if I look at pretty close to the front, so five degrees from the middle, you can think of that as five degrees eccentricity. One hypercolumn in cortex is about half a millimeter by half a millimeter, really tiny. Uh, if you look at the moon, it's about uh, a quarter of a degree, and this in the visual space is uh, the moon is about half a degree. This is a quarter of a degree by quarter of a degree. So each hypercolumn sees a little piece like a quarter the size of the moon, that kind of a size that, that, that is responsible for seeing. Okay. It's got about 4,000 cells, about three quarters of which are excitatory and a quarter in inhibitory. And uh, so we actually looked at how long the exons are Exons are that re exons are what conveys spiking information to other neurons. So we sh we try to use the dimensions of that. Dendrites are where information is received, where you receive the spikes. Okay, so the e neurons are they, they in in this layer the e neurons are relatively simple, and they have uh, shorter exons, um, and the connections are iso isotropic. Okay, and uh, these are these things are all from uh, data. People have done a lot of uh, kind of physiology measurements. So E to E is, I say, 15%. You should think of it as like 10 to 20%. Uh, all the other connections are, some people say 40, some people say 60, some say 80, some say 100. Okay. This monkey and us are very similar. Actually, it's, it's quite similar across species. The, 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 the cell types here are the, the pyramidal cells. They are, they are the same cells, the same I cells, the same E cells. But uh, mice, it's different. Mice, the, the visual cortex is totally disorganized. Un <coughs> so uh, unlike ours, or monkeys, or cat, or ours are much more organized. So in that sense, it's much easier to study because there's a good organization. M mice is like, it's things are pointing every which way, and you kind of, nobody can figure out what's really happening. Okay. I mean, the, the thing is that they, have, they don't have too many cells, and they somehow can make do. They whisk, they mostly whisk, right? The visual system is not very good. You know, right? you know, so, so, um, so if you do the arithmetic about the density, 
then the each ne e neuron is connected to I say 200 is not is between one and 300 right um, th so there are so, so the number of presynaptic neurons meaning the number of neurons connected to a particular neuron is in the hundreds now this may be much smaller the number than <coughs> than you're used to because you probably are thinking about synapses there are many more synapses when one neuron connects to another it makes multiple synapses like on the order of 10 some 10 20 of them okay and these synapses sometimes work sometimes they don't work uh, they um, a good percentage of them work, but okay. Oh, and here's the picture of how it's done in the model. So our hypercolumns are squares. They obviously, hypercolumn is kind of like a human construct. You just look at a bunch of them that you p put them together and you say, this is a hypercolumn. But the columnar structure is real. There really is a columnar structure, okay? So in the model, they're square. And this one is an E neuron. And these are the uh, E neurons that are connected to it following this kind of physiology, guidance from physiology about how, how it should be. So here's an I neuron. It gets a lot of E neuron. And this one can be E or I. And the I cells have shorter axons. That's why they reach like that. So they reach, roughly speaking, like uh, this, this is, so this, this is about 200 plus, And this is uh, 500 micron. Okay. So they, they actually reach quite far in the, in, in, in the so the, I, I just want to give you a sense of how, how the thing looks. It's not that it. They are pretty isotropic. Okay, so it is not the case that neurons with the same properties would choose to co to connect to the, the same properties. Okay, that there probably is some of that too. But by and large, if you look at them, they they are slightly elliptical. But. Hmm. Uh, no, th this is a pre these are presynaptic, so it means that those guys are connected to it. Uh, you connected to me doesn't mean I'm connected to you. Uh, so we do this by kind of uh, flipping a coin. So there's a lot of variability. These are just kind of averages that I'm giving you. Okay. So this is what the uh, architecture looks like. Okay. So now the equations for the neuronal dynamics. So remember, this is a big, big dynamical system made up of little tiny ones, which are neurons. So for neurons, we're using integrated fire uh, equations, which essentially means that we suppress all the biochemical uh, um, reactions and only focus on the electrical properties. Okay? And uh, the biochemical uh, properties are only reflected in how fast they, uh, they cause some, something to happen. Okay? The, so this is Hot, Hodgkin Huxley is a much better model, much uh, more detailed and so on. But you know, Hodgkin Huxley is also not really a complete model. You, it, it's really a high dimensional PDE if you really want to model that. Now, if you want to, to simulate, uh, you know, 50,000 neurons at the same time, you don't want a 200,000 dimensional PDE to, to do this, okay? So I am kind of sacrificing the details about the, the neurons uh, and trying to understand the network properties. For this part of the brain, I think it's reasonable because the neurons are quite similar. When you get to other parts of the brain, they are not so similar, and you really have to deal with all the different neuron types. Okay? So for this, I think it's pretty more or less reasonable. So mostly I'm focusing on the membrane potential, is the difference in charge inside and outside of the membrane of the neuron. And the equation is really very simple. So the how does the membrane potential change? Okay, I, so it, it, it's really at about like, negative uh, 60, 70 millivolts, but uh, I have normalized it to zero and one, so I can <laughs> deal with it. <coughs> so the reset is to zero. When it reaches one, it spikes, okay? And so what happens is that uh, if you do nothing, it leaks. It goes, tries to leak back to zero. And when, there is, when it receives some excitatory input, it will drive it up towards some number which is way up there, so it drives it up there if it gets some excitatory input, E for, for excitatory, right? When it receives in, in inhibitory input, it will try to drive it down to this particular value, and these are called reversal potentials. Okay. This is, so, it, the, there is, so it's gonna oscillate mostly between zero and one when, when it gets, when, it gets a, in, in, uh, when some excitatory neuron hits it, it tries to go up and it tries to push down, so it kind of goes up and down like that, and when it reaches the top, it fires. Okay, 
So what do these um, conductances look like? These are called excitatory and inhibitory conductances. There's a coupling strength. These are the main parameters in, in the model. And the, is the coupling strength multiplied by a curve that looks kind of like this? So, uh, so, the, so this is for an inhibitory uh, thing, so that would be blue. Uh, so throughout the, throughout the talk, red is excitatory, blue is inhibitory. <coughs> so this is what inhibitory conductance looks like. It's gamma. You know, uh, um, it, it, it kind of, when, when it comes, it kind of, it's elevated for a little while. It's mostly gone by 10 milliseconds. The, the, the unit of time is milliseconds. And when it's uh, excitatory, it's even faster. It's gone in a few milliseconds. Okay. But excitatory has two kinds. There's a, the, the AMPA is the fast kind, and there's NMDA, which is much slower. Much slower. It's, it's much more stabilizing. It's about 100 milliseconds to go through. So these are different neurotransmitters, and it's reflected in the time scales in which. So there's a curve that I couldn't draw because it's kind of zero all the way out there <laughs> like that. Okay. Uh, and similarly, so this is the I-conductance, this is the E-conductance, and uh, the same is true for i neurons. <coughs> and the big parameters for the model are these SEI, so how I affects E, how E affects E, how E affects I, and how I affects I. Those are the kind of the, uh, the w among the main uh, parameters, not the only, but among the main parameters for the model. The stimul okay, so yeah, so the stimulus uh, hasn't. I haven't told you what uh, what 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 goes in. O all that I have told you is that when it receives that, this this is. is uh, thank you for asking. Otherwise, this would have s slipped by. Okay, when I said T spike, that means that it receives a spike. The spike could be coming from the local circuit. It could be coming from external. It could be coming from <laughs> feedback. It could be coming from anywhere. Okay. So now, while these are extremely simple equations, this is where the stuff is. So the, the coupling, the, the spike depends. It's very specific. It's the previous uh, picture that I showed you about who is connected to who. When that one spikes, that's that's connected to you. You, re so you, spike your connected. that spike is refers to anyone that's connected to you. It spikes, and then you get a little jolt like that in your conductance. That goes away in a few milliseconds. So during those few milliseconds, if you get pushed over the top, you spike, and then you give a little jolt to all the other ones. Okay? So it's a dynamical system, very clearly, uh, that coupled in the, the, all, the, all the complication lies in the coupling. I don't believe it is possible to write down an explicit solution for even firing rate. Because you know, I mean, you got I. So each excitatory neuron has got 200 other guys. When they spike, they kind of give me a little push, and I may, I may synapse on them again and cause them to do something. There, there's interaction. There's kind of a lot of them. Okay. Um, so so this th the stuff that I'm going to be uh, showing you on the computational level and not on the theorem level, proving level. Although, you know, of course I try to prove theorems too, and so do everyone else. But for much more idealized. Systems. It, well, it's uh, pretty linear, right? Uh, actually, okay. It's, it's just this, right? This one is the thing. But when do the spikes arise? I mean, it's a, oh, this is just a constant times v. Okay. It's a really simple equation, except that you don't know when this, this is a function that's very unknown. The conductance is unknown. It depends on when the Neurons that synapse on you when when they hit, when they spike. Okay. The the conductance doesn't the conductance doesn't, but it how 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 much uh, how much it pushes up depends on where where v is. So it's is see this this number of v e is very far away. You could think of the excitatory the spikes as not depending on v, but inhibitory definitely does because it's minus. Two thirds, so it makes a hell of a difference whether you are close to one or close to zero. Okay, the it you are affected very different amount by it. Okay. Yeah, except for the coupling part, except for these functions. These functions depend on all the other neurons in the system. In my model, it's a statistical thing. Uh, in, in people have done um, p p there are lots of experiments where people have done these things, and they 
there's a probability of connection as function of distance, and those things are measured. Okay, so we try to build that in. Okay. Um, The, the reset, they, I didn't put it in there. When it reaches one, okay, so what, what you actually see is that usually you see a bunch of things and then there's a big excursion in, in the voltage. So uh, I, in this model, it's cut off at one and then you put it back down to zero and it starts again. Actually, then it goes through a little refractory period when it's not very sensitive for a few milliseconds and then it the whole thing just starts again. It gets pushed up, it gets pushed down, okay? But the thing is that, the, the thing is that there's a huge amount of feedback, right? I mean, you excite me, but I, I spike. If you cause me to spike, I'm going to excite you back. I may excite you back, right? So the whole thing is. That that's right. That's right. I uh, can didn't. It's a. It's a little bit cryptic. Yes. Hmm? Oh yeah. So. So when it reaches, yeah, when it reaches one, it goes to zero. So you can think of that as together if you like so okay that's part of the that the, the when the v reaches one it fires a spike okay i probably should have put this in red because that is really important when it when it reaches one it and then it goes to zero and for uh, two or three milliseconds it kind of hears nothing it's not very sensitive to anything and then the whole thing just starts again this is extremely nonlinear because of this you don't know when the spikes arrive, and you and, and actually we'll, we will see that this is kind of when, when it gets interesting. It's, so it's, it's not the, 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 the correlation. The system will self-organize into a lot of patterns by itself okay, that you don't put in. Okay? But so it's good to get this page. Uh, okay? okay, so now um, the next thing is now, now I'm going to talk about so, so I've told you about the individual neurons in uh, 4C. I've told you about the architecture. The next thing is how does LGN connect to 4C alpha? Okay. And so a little bit of background that I want to explain. Okay. So in 4C alpha, <coughs> the most important property besides knowing the location, this ret retinotopic map, is that is it has orientation selectivity. I'm going to write OS for orientation selectivity, meaning that each 4C neuron prefers some edges. So when you show it some edges, when it sees that, say, say your eyes are constantly s kind of moving, right? When this neuron kind of sees an edge moving like that, it gets really excited and it spikes. But if you show it the wrong edge, it doesn't spike at all, okay? So orientation selectivity is the big thing. But the important thing is that LGN has no, your retina has no orientation selectivity, or very close to none. And LGN has no orientation selectivity, and yet at V1, they, they choose edges. So in fact, LGN cells, which you can, as you, which you can equate, um, it's cheating, but you can equate LGN with the retinal ganglion cells. They are very similar, okay? So the LGN cells are of two types. They're on, off. It's, 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 it's very mechanical. It's kind of like a filter. The on ones, it, it, so it sees a really tiny spot in space. And when it goes from light, uh, light to dark, the on ones get excited and they fire a bunch. And the off ones do the opposite. And the rest of the time, they don't fire, okay? So LGN cells are very, very simple. They, it, one likes it when it goes from light to dark. The other one likes it when it goes from dark to light. And they don't, okay? Now, the, the interesting thing is that, so the retinal gang, the, these two are kind of similar, okay? So they only go from light to dark, dark to light, like that. And they have no orientation selectivity at all. And yet, V1 cells prefer edges. So why is it that V1 cells prefer edges? In time, in time. So, so it sees a little tiny space, and then you change it, and then it goes da -da 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 like that when you, okay. you know, pe people usually in, in, in first year courses, they, 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 they show you, so the, you, you get to hear the sound of how these neurons go da -da 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 like that. Okay. It doesn't do anything, yeah. It doesn't do anything. It only it sees the change from light to dark, dark to light. Okay, but I mean, it's, it sees a spot. Why is it that when it comes, and there is nothing between LGN and V1. LGN, one synapse, and goes to V1. But V1 doesn't see the spot. V1 sees the edge, okay? So why is that the case, okay? So this is a very famous story of Hubo and Weasel, okay? And I'm gonna say with a twist, 
because when we started to get into it, we started to run into trouble. Okay. So what is Huber and Weasel's explanation, which is, is, is supported by a lot of evidence and is by and large uh, correct, okay. is, is that, okay, so is that you think of the LGN, you, you think of each cortical neuron as connected to a bunch, uh, to LGN cells that are aligned in certain directions. For example, two rows like this. Let's say these, like, uh, these are on, these are off. So what they do a lot is to, to use a drifting grading to simulate the fact that you, you know, when, when you look in, into space, the blank ones, you don't see so much, you see the edges. Right? And since your eyes kind of move like that, it kind of looks like you're seeing a grading. Okay? So, when, when, so this thing is drifting, and if, these, if, if, if the V1 cell is connected to two rows of on and off cells like this, there will come a time when this part is changing from light to dark, dark, dark to light, and this part is changing from light to dark, if it's got the right width, right? Then all of those cells will get really excited. And when too many cells are excited, it kind of causes the V1 cells to become very excited. Okay? This is the theory of Hubo and Weasel. Okay? And it has withstood the test of time. Okay? So there are either two bands or three bands. You can see this through different uh, electrophysiology kind of mapping. And it really, so, so I, I, I hope this part is uh, uh, clear because it's, it's, it's important. Uh, so, for example, here's another configuration of uh, the, so, so some another V1 cell may be connected to this bunch of, uh, uh, of LGN cells. So this one would like a grading that's going at 45 degrees. Okay? And it would like a grading where the width is wider than this one. Okay? So it basically it likes it when it gets to the stage when everybody is excited and the, the sum is greater than, I mean, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So if all of them are excited, the, the V1 cells get super uh, excited. Okay. So uh, the, the, there are two, uh, so these are two quite widely held views until quite recently. One is that sensory systems are largely feed forward. This was the ideas of Hubo and Wiesel, uh, that the, at least the part that's close to the input of sensory, uh, sensor closer to the sensory input, it's mostly a single direction. The information flow is largely in one direction. So um, uh, if, uh, if I could quote, like, uh, so, so one of our colloquium speakers in uh, NYU, they, he would say that, no, 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 it's not as feed forward as you think. It's not like it's a hundred times feed forward. Uh, it's only a few times feed forward. Uh, but people's idea is that really that at the input level, things are really flowing one way. And I don't know where this came from, but I bugged all of my neuroscience colleagues and I asked them, how many, how many LGN cells uh, is uh, each V1 cell? Yeah, most people tell me it's 20, 30. Okay. And uh, as a matter of fact, these uh, pictures are taken from previous modeling papers. And these are the simpler pictures. The rest of them are even more complicated. OK, so this is Hubo and Weasel. Now the twist. Okay. So here comes the twist. Because as we started to dig into it, there's actually a lot of experimental data, and not so new either, that points to the fact that if you look at each hypercolumn, there's really only about 10 LGN cells, five on and five off. And that to me was a little bit shocking, because this is like an area that covers like a good area of your thumbnail, and it's covered by 10 LGN cells, five on and five off. That's very, very few, right? Okay. And so, but the, the data is really very solid because uh, so th those three um, are going at it from different directions. One is measuring from the Latin LGN, one is measuring actually the cortex, and Gelucci is kind of uh, doing something completely different. Okay? And there are other concerns also. You know that the LGN, when it goes to cortex, it doesn't branch very far. There is, there's just a main branch, and then there's a ramifying branch. But it doesn't go very far. And they know how far it goes. And you also know that there, there are preferred spatial frequencies, which must be reflected by how far apart these LGN cells are. So got a problem when you try to do the modeling. Okay? They have to be far apart. There are very few of them. They don't reach very far. So how are you going to fit all of those things in? Okay? So the picture is going to look more like this. If this is a sheet of LGN, it will have to look more like this rather than those. And as I, s th these are taken from earlier modeling papers. They're on and off, on and off, okay? So 
you can only choose, right? There are only a few, right? I mean, it, it, if, it's only, if it's only like nine or 10, you choose nine or 10, you're not gonna see any orientation. You have to choose very few of them in order to see the orientation, okay? And they have to be far apart. Otherwise, the, the, because, the, because it prefers uh, these gratings with a certain width apart, okay? But there's very few of them. They don't reach very far, okay? So there's a, so these are the simpler pictures in other earlier modeling papers. If I were gonna put in a few more, they are much bigger and much more complicated. But it doesn't look like it can be like that, okay? So there it poses a geometric combinatorial problem that we worry doesn't have solutions at all. As it turns out, it barely does. You can barely fit them in when you can't. If, if you want them farther apart still, you won't fit. <laughs> okay, you could barely fit from using like uh, one to six LGN cells. But even if it barely fits, okay, so, so for example, a four one, for th this one is for vertical. It, it, is, it, it has to have be this kind of width apart. So it can be four, so it may be these four, or it could be the bottom four, or it could, could be five. But this is about as big as we could possibly fit it. If you fit more, it's not gonna see anything, okay? So now, is this really gonna constrain angle? You know, this is supposed to like horizontal. Uh, but, but what about like this? It also <laughs> sees that, right? So somehow it doesn't do, it doesn't seem to do a very good job at constraining angle. And also, because there are so few choices, you, why, I can only see four angles? That's not true, right? We can discern a lot of different angles. So uh, we were very concerned that we couldn't put the thing together. But anyway, so we went ahead, and uh, so this is how the model, the, I'm, I'm now telling you what the model did, okay? So in, in the, uh, in, in, in from electrophysiology, one knows that each hypercolumn has a kind of pinwheel structure uh, arranged by cells that are grouped together that like certain orientation. So we mimic that, so we took, th this is Cortex, this is LGN, which uh, I have identified the two, of course one is here, one is there, and totally different spaces, but uh, so we did divided cortex up into six. The reason I took six is because it's got this symmetry that's easy to work with. People usually see four, to, can discern between four to six different groups. Okay. And then for the ones that are vertical, I would choose uh, something like this. For the ones that are horizontal, I would choose something like that. Randomly flip a coin and pick something that's within bounds. That's how it's done. And that's it. Okay. Okay. Now. I want you to be, uh, I mean, of course, the fact that I'm telling you about the model is that it worked out, right? So, but I want to tell you that it, we were very concerned that it wasn't going to work. It's not like it was obvious that it, was, it would work. And it's kind of actually amazing that it did at all, okay? So I want to tell you more about the concerns. So the geometric constraints from LGN are very weak. We already saw that, okay? It's isotropic. Look how far it goes. It doesn't just talk to the ones in its own orientation domain. It talks to everybody, practically, in the whole thing. So it's going to be all smeared out, and, and that's kind of a problem. Here's another problem. If you, by the time you count the spike ray, count the number of LGN cells and so on, you're going to find that only about 10% of the currents it receives is from feet forward. So it gets very weak current from feet forward. The current is poorly constrained, and the neurons talk to each other. It's kind of mixed for a, a situation where you, you wonder if it would work at all. Okay, so the last part of the, uh, of, of the model is layer six, okay. In real cortex, okay, layer six receives, 4C alpha gets a lot of feedback from layer six, and layer six talks to both LGN and many other parts of D1. It kind of collects information from everywhere. So the question is how to model this? Now this is not an isolated modeling issue because biological systems are never close. If it's not close, that means there's feed forward, there's feedback. Feedback stuff is not the same as feed forward because by definition it has passed through you and it's collected things downstream. And if you didn't model that, how do you know what's downstream to, to come back, right? So it's, it's an issue. Um, and uh, I think one that, so almost all models, visual models have no feedback at all. But there's actually a lot of feedback, so I don't know how one could do without it. So here's our imperfect solution, very imperfect solution. I don't know how to do it. It depends on information downstream that you don't know yet. So how do you model something like that, okay? 
So we took layer six to be a similarly con connected network, but driven by both uh, 4C and other sources. Okay? We incorporated features of the layer six neurons, which in particular, one of the things is that they have bigger receptive fields. They are tiny spikes and they fire more. So we try to, try to build all these properties in. And then we take the firing, firing rate to be indexed to the same region of layer four. So basically, it feeds back information to layer four Con convolved with in a bigger area because layer six is known to have a bigger, okay? So our feedback is basically very similar to what is happening here, mixed with other things from convolved to a larger area and put back into, okay? Uh, this is our imperfect solution for it so far. Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, tell you about uh, what are the phenomena that were we were able to replicate, okay? So uh, I, th this is just a kind of a, a quick list, and then I, will, I want to show you pictures rather, okay? So first thing that you do is firing rate. That's the most basic thing. Firing rate is not one number. There's spontaneous driving rate, there's driven firing rate, there's driven at different angles, driven in orthogonally, driven, okay? And there's E cells, there's I cells, there's mean, there's distribution, dozens of data uh, for firing rates that we tried. So we tried to match those, okay? Orientation tuning, each neuron, chooses some orientation, so we show that. And collectively, they, they do some, there are statistics that measure some, something called circular variance that measures how, uh, how selective they are to different parts. There are simple and complex cells. Uh, simple cells, so there are two kinds of cells. Uh, one follows the grading. It is modulated by the grading, so it goes kind of, if the grading it goes at four hertz, they will kind of go up and down with four hertz. Those are the simple cells. Complex cells don't follow anybody. They just fire whenever they, whenever they fire, okay? So for us, the simple cells are the ones with more LGN input than the complex cells. And there's not a whole lot in between. They're simple, mostly simple, complex. there's some in between. Um, and it's measured by mathematical quantities called modulation ratios, okay? There's spatial frequency preferences that I mentioned before. And then there is also a spontaneous production of rhythm in the brain that I would like to get to in a moment. And all of these things are relatively robust. Okay, so the model uh, actually reproduces all of these things in a fairly robust way. Now, by robust, I want to clarify what that means. You can't hold all parameters fixed and change one. That's not allowed, okay? That's because if you have too much excitation, you have got to balance it. You have to offset. But you can move things. Basically, it, it's like a, in parameter space, it's like a thickened up lower dimensional object. But you can move in a very robust way and maintain all of these properties in there. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, 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 to uh, say. The, the four main parameters are the coupling, but there are other ones like how, fi how quickly the, the, the uh, AMPA arises, the relative speed of them. So it, uh, it's on the order of 10 plus. It's not 100, it's more like 10. About 10 dimensional, roughly, okay? So there are uh, earlier models uh, that you may have heard about called NYU models, where they put in like 130 parameters and the whole thing became uncontrollable. Okay. See, the, the moment you put in parameters, you don't understand what they're doing and it's a big problem, okay? So, so this thing is pretty parsimonious. So you see it's a model. Yeah, yeah. Basically, you have to kind of balance. Uh, I don't know. It depends on what, wh where, where you are and what you are moving and so on. But you, you can clear, you, you, you get the strong sense that some things are kind of tacked together. If you move one, the other ones have to go along in some way. Right? You, you, you can see that. Okay. We, we did not do so, hmm? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not one dimension, but it's lower. It's, lower. it's actually maybe 10 to 15 uh, parameters. And locally, you can see that you can move in three or four different directions, but they are, yeah, the things have to move together. You can't hold everything fixed and then go. You can move a little, very little. You can move a very little. When I say move, I can move a lot. Right? It's not a low dimensional manifold. It's a fat, it's a thickened lower dimensional manifold. Yeah. That's kind of the feel that you get. 
uh, we did not do uh, these uh, uh, kind of machine learning or parameter sweep, that type of thing, because I, it was actually, uh, we were looking at uh, neurobiology. We were trying to explain why does this work, okay? If it doesn't work, why does it not work? So I need to move this parameter like that rather than to, so it, it was actually built up from, from, okay, so pictures now, okay? So here is a, uh, what I'm showing you, uh, the response of uh, the model cortex to eight different gradings at a fixed spatial frequency is high contrast and is mixed in one second. But before I show it to you, I want to make sure you understand what you are seeing. The only thing that is uh, shown to the model is the grading. So it's a function, g of x comma t. x is location, t is time, okay? g is the light intensity. So g of x t, x comma t. That's the only thing that's shown to the model. The LGN cells respond to that. The LGN tells, therefore, what to do. Layer four talks to each other, tells layer six, layer six bounces the thing back, okay? So, and this is kind of what it looks like. So, first of all, the colors indicate firing rate. So the brighter, the higher the firing rate. And I have, so this is a picture that I've shown you before. Each one is a hyper column, and I've indicated the locations where the intended orientation. Now, intended orientation doesn't mean the neurons will actually respect that, right? Intended means that I give it these like three or four LGN cells, which may not be enough to constrain it. So they actually do all kinds of different things. But anyway, I want so each picture here, it's it's a uh, it's another uh, it's, it's a copy of that. So let's look at, for example, zero means vertical. So if you look at vertical, I see three diamonds here that are vertical and I see three half diamonds over there, and these are the ones that lit up when you, when, when you drew it, okay? So you can say, okay, okay, that I gave them all vertical gradings and they responded. Okay, let's try 45 degrees. There's no, photo, okay? I have deliberately used six here and eight there so that it's incommensurate. So there are, um, so this is 30 and this is 60, there's no 45. So 45, the model has to combine there's no 45 degree LGN things at all, okay? The model has to do it, so what do I see? I see uh, 45, this would be this combination, this combination, that one, and maybe over there, and this is 45, da da da, da da da, following that, okay? So it can actually do it quite well. Um, uh, horizontal, those, are over there, okay? So what are these little boxes? If you imagine that you, for fMRI, you, the resolution is about, what is the resolution of fMRI? Like a couple millimeters maybe, and a few seconds, okay? So these tiny boxes that I don't know if you can see is 50 microns by 50 microns, and it's got 50 neurons in there. Uh, one could actually see this, this is average over a second, but I assure you that you can watch this as it happens. It gets you dizzy, don't do, don't watch that. It kind of is flickering all over the place, okay? Uh, the neurons have very great variety. The average over one second, one second. Okay, you, I could average over like 200 milliseconds or something like that, but in the picture would look very different if I show you average over 15 or 25 milliseconds because you will find the different parts going up and down and bouncing back and forth, okay? So, uh, uh, so if you imagine some really super high in time resolution and in space, this is what a model can do, right? Because the simulations you can, you can do do uh, do it as a. Okay, this is the same picture. I just want to I put the square there to get you to focus on the pin pinwheel structure. So if you go like this and you turn around, you should see this thing turning around. Now focus on what's inside the square here, here, down, southwest, east. Okay, you see it turn around inside the, okay. So, hmm? orientation, orientation left is prescribed in the sense of hooking onto these three or four LGN cells. And the, it, it, I, uh, it, it's, the, it, it's, you are limited to only LGN cells that, there's only one group of cells that can reach that neuron because you know that the LGN cells don't reach very far. 
Okay, so you don't have a whole lot of choices, and you put in somewhere between one to six uh, LGN cells, uh, randomly picked, but respecting by and large that orientation. But the thing is that they talk to each other, and they talk to each other, they reinforce each other, and that so so the the, the orientation you can see how it turns is turning actually kind of. You know, you can say quite well, but this is one hyper column. You surely don't rely on that one hyper column. You rely on many, many hyper columns. To see. But it is actually yeah, it's doing. It's not so bad. Yeah. Okay, so here's uh, how it responds to contrast. So this is a this is a magnol system. It's very, very sensitive. They saturate very quickly. So by 20% contrast, uh, it kind of nearly saturates, not completely. The half is somewhere between 10 to 15. So these are the, the same pictures as before, except that I'm showing you how low contrast. Okay. Now, the, so there's a fact is that people used to think that in lower contrast, the region lit up is very small, and then it gets bigger. It's not true. People now know that it's the footprint is very similar, and indeed, you see the si very similar footprint at low contrast and at high contrast. I tell you that this is a kind of really scary one to try to do, because even it's not a whole lot of it's not a whole lot of input. It's only a few LGN cells. And they're not firing that at low contrast. They're not firing that high. But Cortex knows it somehow. It, it, it gets all the orientations right. Sometimes it's a little bit messy, and it gets it right. And it gets exactly the right footprint of where, where it goes. Okay. So it's something is uh, probably more or less right. Okay. okay so uh, I'm. It statistically, they look the same. Yeah, but a, if 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 I if I showed you like 100 uh, millisecond pictures, they look they change, they change. Uh, start to kind of settle at two or three hundred milliseconds. They start to kind of more average is more. But I, if you if you watch it happening, it it uh, you you don't know what is happening at all if you watch it in even a higher time resolution. Uh, it's somehow only in bulk. It does the right thing. But we don't rely on just that one hypercolumn. We <laughs> rely on lots and lots of hypercolumns, right? Okay, so uh, this is the kind of the last thing. Hmm? What do you mean? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it, it, you, you can uh, in you, you will see this shape if I show you like 100 to 200 milliseconds. But if I do it faster, I've I've looked at it at like 10 millisecond kind of the 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 eyes uh, don't like it; <laughs> they go completely crazy, and you cannot pick out these shapes at all. It kind of fl flickers everywhere. Yeah, no, no, one second is very. Well, it's too late. It's too late. Yeah. Yeah, so these pictures are nicer than they would be if I look at them. They, it would be kind of more partial, and some maybe some parts are brighter than others. But then we have so many hyper columns. We, 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 yeah, ex exactly. Probably, right? And also, your eyes never really focus in one spot. They are constantly, your, your retina is con constantly moving. Okay, so this is the, 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 uh, the last uh, part that I would like to talk about. Okay, so some issue raised earlier is whether or not this weak and ill-constrained LGN currents is enough. Okay, so another question is what causes the gamma rhythms? Okay, so all over the brain, the you you see you hear a rhythm that's somewhere between uh, 30 hertz and 90 hertz or something like that. All over the brain, you detect it. The, the you, it it just kind of makes some kind of a rhythm. It's not a, 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 a it's, it's, it's not os oscillatory. It's actually quite broadband, but you detect this 30 to 90 hertz kind of thing. So what people used to think that it was did that to serve some purpose, that it was some for some reason, um, people are starting to think more and more that it really just has to do with neurons going back and forth. So this is what I'm showing you now is a local population in one of the orientation domains and it's strongly driven, and you see a rhythm, okay? This is totally so. So these are the E cells. This is this, so. This is cell number. This is time, okay? Red is uh, excitatory. Blue is inhibitory. Nobody told these neurons to fire like that. They completely organized themselves to fire at a rhythm, 
And this is the power spectral density. It's broadband. It, our thing goes from about 40 to 80, with peaking at 60, which is inside the gamma range. Uh, it's emergent, totally emergent. That, uh, so the neurons are not constructed to do any of this, and they are certainly not told at what time to do this. They this is strongly driven. Oh, but say with a grading at 2 hertz or 4 hertz, but this is going at 60 hertz, so don't try to attach it to the, to the it, it's, it's doing it its own thing. It's not the, it's very weak. Uh, it, it's, it's very, very weak. It has, it has a little bit of, it's not flat, the power. Actually, it kind of goes a little bit up like that, okay? But this, the, the gamma rhythm is something known to occur when it's stimulated, and it, it just goes. It doesn't matter if you have to be amazing high stimulation to get it? No, it has to be good for that. Uh, it, so this is a local, it, it relies on the local population all being stimulated. So gradings are great for that if you want to look at a local orientation domain because they all like the same grading. So if you use spots, it's not going to happen. Okay, spots, they don't like spots, right? They like edges, they don't like spots, okay? You have to, the key is that you have to stimulate a whole local group of population in, and then, no, these, these are neuron spiking. That's very, uh, what does EEG measure? Is, is it, is it uh, electrical properties, right? It, I think it's the same, I think it's the same, I think it's the same. But this, this is spiking, it's not the, so, so people measure the uh, LFT and so on, so, but the, these are actually spikes that, that it's easier for, for, for the model to interpret, okay? Now in case you, so this is a blown up picture of that. Now in case you think that, oh, this is a population, the whole population is spiking. No, it's not. Uh, and th these are five millisecond intervals. Uh, if you look at this is 100%, it's only about 10% of them on average uh, participating. More eyes are participating. This is I, this is E. So the E is only really only 510, but so these are the complex cells. They, they, they fire, much, they, they have much higher firing rate than the simple cells. Okay, so they, it, it's an emergent phenomenon. Random. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hmm? The time scale uh, the, is five, is here, it's half a second. So this is the power spectral density, right? So I'm telling you that they, the, see, some gaps are wider, right? This is wider and this is narrower, okay? They range roughly from 40 to 80 hertz. Hmm? The time constants of the neuron, okay? So I'm actually going to, uh, I go five more minutes, okay? okay. What do you mean for Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, the, 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 the inhibitory ones are shorter, they're more compact. The excitatory ones go farther. It's kind of random. If you look at that, it's not the same neurons that participate in the same event. It's completely different neurons that participate in the same e event. Okay. So I, I want to show you a little bit more of that. So there are two previously proposed mechanisms for gamma. One is a very well-known one called PING from uh, Nancy Coppell um, a little while ago. So this is, think of this as a cartoon. It was a little while back and it's perhaps intended as a cartoon, okay? So in this picture, the drive are only to E cells and E's are only connected to I and I are only connected to E. So that's not true, but this is the cartoon, okay? So you drive the E, the E's, the whole population spike and the whole population after it spikes, it causes the I's to spike. So they suppress the E for a while and when they let go, the next one comes through because you're driving the next cell, okay? So this is kind of wh what started this whole business. And then there is uh, uh, a, f a few years ago, uh, together with uh, Adi Rangan, we started to do something that's a little bit more realistic, uh, also looking at a model that's more abstract than the present one, is that, so we said, okay, wait, wait, wait. We, you don't see population spikes in the brain unless you're having epileptic seizure or something like that, okay? They only have like a few percent of the, these things participate, okay? And so there is, so we propose that it's really the crossing of threshold by a few E neurons, and when the E neurons cross, the when the E neurons spike, the synapse on both E and I 
you don't get to choose who to synapse on, right? Okay. So you excite both the E and I, and then some of them will spike. So that's why they kind of more or less happening together. But the eyes would then the, the eyes have a longer lasting tail in the, in the conductance. So they suppress it for a while, and then when they release it, so it's not really that uh, different than uh, the ping, but the picture is uh, much closer to what one, one would expect. And the differences are that it's not population spike, it's partial activation only, like only 10%, okay? Um, and also it's simultaneous. It's not like all the E's go first and then all the I go first, but it's simultaneous. But the mechanism that's absent there is that there's recurrent E and I interaction that's causing this. Now, um, there's always this inhibition. It, so, so some people, so in neuroscience, the debate is that do you fire a spike because the I neurons let you, nam namely that they just lift it, they, they have like a grip on everything, and they just lift it, and so you fire a spike? That's one view. The other view is that no, 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 it's not that. It's the excitatory neurons that excite you, so you fire the spike, okay? So I, he, in this picture, the inhibitory neurons have to let you, otherwise you won't be able to fire the spike. But the spikes are not fired exactly where the inhibitory neurons release, okay? So I, this is my, my, my uh, the last picture slide, okay? So we looked inside the model, okay? Uh, I warn you that these things may not be correct. This is what the model says, okay? So, and, but I'm very proud of these traces. These are the voltage traces of a simple cell and of a complex cell. My experimental colleagues cannot tell them from apart from the real one. Okay. Okay. They look exactly like this. So this simple cell is following the, following the grading. And this is a four hertz. Hmm? This is just pick a random neuron and read it off. Okay. This is a simple cell. The complex cells, they fire when they choose. They fire a lot more. They fire two to three times as much. They don't care. So I have seen these f from real cells. These are conductances and these are currents, and I have not seen those in, in the lab. It should be possible to get them, but I haven't seen them. Okay. Look at how they really try to balance each other out. The uh, red is E, uh, uh, blue is I. Okay. So let's blow these things up to have a look at them some more. Okay. Well, we try to put in the uh, electro, we, we, we try to follow the neurophysiology, we try to follow the anatomy, we try to use the time constants, and it produces things that actually look very similar to the ones that, right. But, but it's only a tiny fraction of the real brain, right? It's not the real brain. So the hard part is choosing the right part to make it, to, to, to make these things come out, okay? Oh, they change, yeah. They change. You, uh, I mean, we went down many wrong turns and many wrong, uh, and you don't match them if you don't do the <laughs> kind of the right thing. So. Uh, the depends on what you mean by time constants. They, the, the couplings are not the same. They, uh, they, they, they basically, they have mean, and they have some fluctuations around the mean. The, some things come from experimental data. Some things are not known. Coupling strings are not known from experimental data. You cannot know how the neurons are coupled from experimental data. What you can know is oh, how big of an effect it has, and then you try to deduce what the coupling strings would have to be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, comes from the, that, that comes from standard physics. Yeah. Roughly, yeah, roughly. Uh, the, the, oh. you, you don't have to worry about uh, the variability here. The diversity of neurons is so large that I actually feel bad showing you a couple of them because I'm going to be misleading you. They all do completely different things. The time decay constant is the same. The coupling constants are different. The, uh, 
the synapse strength are, are different because from time from spike to spike because some synapse some percentage of synapses fail right so the coupling strengths are all kind of random from time to time like that okay if you look at one neuron it really does quite crazy things and it's somehow you have to look at them together so this is these are two just two and it's, uh, I, as I said it's, it's really not fair to show you two because they're all really different this is a complex cell and so this shows the E and the I, and these are the spikes that occur. You can see that the, the E and I currents that come into a neuron self-balance. Nobody told them to balance it, but it seems to balance quite well. And when it gets out of balance, when the E's have a momentary excess, a spike is fired. Okay? So, so the thing just, just happens like that. And this is a decomposition, a breakdown into the E neuron. Now, if you look at this one, it tends to fire quite early on in the in 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 this uh, in in this uh, event, right? It fires quite early. It's not one of the latest one, and this neuron seems to be really affected by layer six, which is shown in gray here. So you see, the layer six is throwing a lot of. Uh, it, it has its own pulse, which is, uh, and these pulses cause a fair number of the spikes. This is an I one. This is one of the, these times when it's really high, boom, 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 like that. It's very very high and it causes the spikes to happen exactly over there. So what uh, conclusions did we draw from these? Is that, okay, so, so th these things are to be tested, right? This is what a model says, but I've shown you two very specific neurons there. So, so first, this is true, is that the bulk of the current really comes from the local circuit. It doesn't come from LGN, it doesn't come from feedback, it comes from the local circuit, okay? A and there was a question earlier about whether the local circuit is always short or long. For this layer, it's only short. It's, only, it's very local. For other layers, there are longer range ones, but not here. Okay? There's a self-balancing of currents that you can see how th these are currents that are really well balanced, especially when it's not spiking. It's, it look at this balance to a T, right? I mean, how, okay? so, so people, there in, there's a, a theory of balanced states when people say, on average, uh, when you average over time, average over neurons, the currents have to be balanced. Um, yeah, otherwise the thing would be spiking through the roof or not spiking, okay? But what is happening is that moment by moment, neuron by neuron, it balances itself. No attempt is, in fact, I don't know how to manipulate it because these currents depend on all the other neurons that are spiking, right? It seems to do that and whenever it just goes a little bit ahead, a spike happens, okay? It's a very momentary thing, okay? The thing is that the pulses from external sources, LGN in this case, and in this case, layer six, seems to be much more potent than the percentages would indicate. So this, I think this is very good proof. What happens is that the LGN kind of pushes the voltage and kind of sets the baseline much higher. So a little bit of something just causes it to go over. Okay? It, it, so it, it, they're more potent for two different, by, ex by external, I don't mean a, a visual stimulus, I mean some other layer, not the local, not the local circuit. Okay? Uh, it can do that by actually sets the baseline higher, like it does here. It can do that by actually giving a little pulse, kind of packs a punch. Because the, pul the punches from external sources are not going, doing this kind of, uh, 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 th this swinging back and forth thing, they tend to be more potent because they come from a different, they come at the wrong times they can. And uh, we're conjecturing why, whether or not this is one reason why, uh, so little feed forward has such a large effect, right? The LGN only has a few percent, like in the, why is it that it can have such a large effect and it, right? And so finally, about the mechanism for gamma, uh, so which one is it? Okay, now ping is, uh, is, is, is the first uh, sh shot and it's, a, is, is very uh, cartoonish. There's a fair amount of recurrent EI. Look at it, it it's really going up, it's not from it's not from disinhibition. It's actually it's going up when it's, when it's firing. It's definitely recurrent excitatory inhibitory action. It is quite seriously aided by external, either the feed forward or feedback, according to this model. Disinhibition is always, is n tends not to fire because the, just the moment the eye neurons lets it, you can look at that and that show, tells you it's not, but the eye neurons kind of have to, the, the, the eye currents have to be lower before it can fire. So there's some, it's mixed, it's very nuanced, it's not as simple as uh, anyone, <laughs> any of the earlier things, okay? So the conclusion is that 
nature has created an amazing cortex which works in efficient and subtle ways. I can say this a million times and I can't say it enough. It's really, the more you look at this, like how can it work? Well, it just does. <laughs> and it's really, I would not have been able to design any dynamical system that could do any of these things, okay? But nature did that, okay? So following the neuroanatomy as best we can in the neurophysiology, we've built a mathematical model that reproduces many of the basic ph phenomena. The model is alive in the sense that we didn't tell it what to do. We just show it this G of XT, okay? Show it the light intensity map, which is what is the visual stimulus that you get, and it computes all these other things. Um, truth be told, we haven't done this part correctly. We've done the steady state part correctly. The transient part, we haven't done correctly. That's why uh, the, the way it approaches the steady state, is, I, I can't really claim that. Um, the model analysis, we hope will give some insight into the neural mechanisms. What I said about that may or may not be true. Well, uh, you can go find out, right? This is kind of the point of theory experiment interaction, right? Okay. So what does the model construction involve? It involves solving a nonlinear inverse problem, it's fair to say, in the sense that you have some information about the dynamical system. The information is very incomplete because you cannot tear open the brain, right? And you, I mean, the things are coupled the way they are. You can measure the effects of a lot of things coupled together. You cannot take them apart. So the information is very, is very partial. But what you have is that you can stimulate it and see what output it gives. So from these two, you try to reconstruct the dynamical system. How many parameters do you have? Uh, 10 plus, mm -hmm. 10 plus. That those voltage. No, no, they do. Yeah. It, yeah. Actually, once you get the thing going, it involves a little bit of tweaking here and there. Um, the the thing is really quite robust. There's one thing that's not robust is the is whether a cell is simple or complex. That's not robust at all, and nor is it robust in real life. Okay. Uh, cells are not born simple or complex. They become simple or complex due to interactions. And so if under different circumstances, the same cell could be one thing or the other, and the percentage could change. But that aside, the other things are very robust. They, they uh, in some ways, yeah, for some things and not for other things necessarily. Okay, so for example, the, the way that this simple yeah, cells, your parameters are probably very different than mine, right? So some of them have uh, fatter, wider gaps. The gamma rhythms can be slower or faster. Some things would be stronger or weaker. Qualitatively, they look very similar. Okay? But no, they're not. They're very far from identical. Okay? Um, so so the, and the, the challenge is um, really the, the which part of neurobiology is relevant and which part is implicated. Okay? Um, there's so many things around. What do you put in that's, you know, what, what is relevant for what? Okay? So this is kind of, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, part of figuring out which part is relevant and what is implicated is kind of goes towards understanding some kind of underlying principles, which of course I cannot claim that we have, but you know, we had enough to put together this <laughs> model. Uh, so, uh, acknowledgement. Um, most of the work is done by uh, Robert Shapley, is a real neuroscientist uh, at the CNS of uh, NYU. He used to be an experimentalist. Now he has got a ton of data. And uh, Logan's postdoc, and these are my other postdocs. And if you've got postdocs, <laughs> or students <laughs> who want a job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>